Uh, this is a little backwards today. I'm going to jump into the sermon uh, right off the top, essentially. Uh, we're in a series called The Ten Things That God Hates and Ten Things God Loves. And uh, I'm going to review the stuff that we've been doing, that we've talked about so far, and then jump into uh, our two elements for today, all right? Uh, the review is like this. Ten things God loves and ten things God hates. God loves those who love him. God loves those who keep his commands. Uh, God hates arrogance. We're doing loves. I can do loves. God loves those who fear him. God hates arrogance. God hates lying. And God hates idolatry, being replaced by cheap knockoffs. Amen? So that's what we have so far. You, if you, if you, uh, well, I think the screen will come back up later uh, because we're going to talk about all of this a little bit today. Um, today we're going to add two more, two more parts to this series. Again, if you haven't been able to hear the, hear the previous installments, you can find that on the Campus Ministries Facebook page. Um, and, and catch up. But just so you know, just so all of us know, um, this series was birthed out of two questions, right? One question was, do we know what God loves or hates? Do we know what God loves or hates? And the second question was, who knows what the second question was? Do we care? Do you know what God loves and hates? As we're looking at life through the lens of Christ, do we know what God loves and hates? And the second question, which again, I think is more important than the first, is do we care? To some degree, all of our biblical study and our religious practices uh, matter, don't, don't really matter outside of those two questions. It's the same with any relationship. Do you know what the object of your affection loves and hates? And more importantly, when you know, do you care enough to make some adjustments? Sometimes we can know what the person we love, what the person that we, we are interested in, we can know what they love and we can know what they hate. But then the second question is, do I care enough about what they love, about what they hate, to do anything about it? Amen? And sometimes that makes the difference between a three-month relationship and one that goes on forever. Amen? So as we continue in our mission to see life through the life of Christ, we're going to study what matters to the heart of God. And so today we're going to add just one more love and one more hate. And if time permits, we're going to engage in a little bit of discussion this morning. So let's get at it. As I've told you guys before, I'm not worrying about a whole bunch of fancy transitions and connecting this to that. We're just going to go through it. And hopefully, I, I hope you care enough about your own development that you'll look into this stuff outside of this chapel time. Number three, or no, I don't know if it's number three or not, but what God loves today is a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. If you've gone to anything, something like church, you've heard this phrase before. Yes? But let me see if you've heard that phrase before. God loves a cheerful giver. You've heard at least a church mother say it, a deacon or a pastor, somebody trying to get kids to camp. You've heard somebody say, God loves a cheerful giver. It always seems, though, that the people, to me, in my tradition anyway, it always seems like the people who would say God loves a cheerful giver are, like, mad when they say it, right? Like, it's their idea, and they're trying to convince us to do a godly idea. But not only is it a godly idea, it's not our idea, it's a godly idea. Not only is it a godly idea, it's on the short list of things that God loves. God loves a cheerful Giver. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. As, I've, as Jess and I have said numerous times, our text for this entire series is going to be biblically based. So 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 6, it says this. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Hey, you. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Here's, here's the point to this one, real, real simple. How you give, how we give, 
is more important to God than what you give or the fact that you give at all. If you read that text again, God is talking about how you give. He's like, I'm not concerned with what you give. I'm not concerned with the fact that you give. What I'm concerned about is how you give, the attitude in which you give. The attitude of the giver matters more to God than the amount that you give. The attitude matters more. The appearance of the giving matters more. I don't know if anybody else, I, I love animated movies, and Despicable Me is one of my favorite animated movies, right? And, and if you know the story, Gru is sort of like this villain dad, if you can have that. He's like this villain dad, and he has these three little girls, and one of the girls asks him for a goodnight kiss, and he says no. Right? And then the little girl says, pretty please, and he says, the appearance of the please does not matter. The answer is still no. Right? But it's different with God. The appearance of the giving, the attitude of the giving does matter to God. According to scripture, that is true about God and what God thinks about how we give. It's not so true about us men and women. A few years ago, there was this campaign that started nationally called the Day of Big Giving. Have y'all heard of that? It's called the Big Day of Giving. If you look online, you'll see it. It's a day of big giving. and It's a one-day thing that this year happens on May 5th. And the idea is charities all around the country, on the day that you give to those charities, if you give on May 5th, they get double what you give, right? And so it's called the Day of Big Giving. And so their whole push, they want you to give all year, but their whole push is really to get you to give on the Day of Big Giving because on the Day of Big Giving, they get double. So trust me when I say that those charities, when they receive our money, they don't care about the attitude in which you give. Amen? They don't care about, they don't care if you're having a good day, they don't care if you're having a bad day, they don't care about your mindset, they don't care about your, your displacement, your disposition. Cheerful or not, the concern for them that day is that we give. The only thing that matters is that we give, cheerful or not. Their need for our money is the motivation of that day. Social entrepreneur majors, this is an important truth for you. It, do, it doesn't matter how I give. So those organizations don't care how I give. Those, uh, those things don't matter. Every month I give to a, a few charities. Whether I'm having a good day, whether I'm having a bad day, whether I want to, whether or not, it comes out of my bank account and into theirs. And I can promise you, nobody is sitting over there wondering the heart of which I gave. Amen? It goes out of my account and into theirs. But it's not the same with God. God absolutely cares about the attitude in which I'm giving. How I give, and we're not just talking about money. Please know that. How I give cares more to God than what I give. Here's why. Because God has no need. Unlike those charities, unlike you who somebody is paying for your college God has no need. God has no lack. Let's look at scripture. Psalm 50, verses 7 through 15, it says this. It talks about the cattle on the thousand hills are God's. It says this, listen, my people, and I will speak. I will testify against you, Israel. I am God, your God. I bring no charges against you concerning your sacrifices or concerning your burnt offerings, which are ever before me. Hear this. He says, I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the field are mine. This is the coldest bop right here. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and everything that is in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Sacrifice thanksgivings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High and call me on the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. God says, I don't need your stuff. I don't need your things. But he said at the end of it, what I need is your respect. What I want, what I care about is your respect. And what I care about is the attitude in which you give. He is the God of all creation. Even the things that we make are made from the things that God created. Amen? So when God says, if I were hungry, 
I wouldn't tell you. He's saying because if I, were, if I needed something, I wouldn't tell you because everything that you would give me is mine. If I were hungry, seriously, if I were hungry, have you, y'all have been hungry. Y'all are in college. Y'all have been hungry. And on those hungry days, whoever is willing to feed you is a friend. Amen? Amen. Some of you are going to go to some of the events that the college offers just because there's free food. <laughs> But God says, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you because he has no need. His concern, again, is how we give, how we give back to him or how we give back to the world. His concern is how we give our money, how we give our time, how we give our talent. And he loves to see us do it cheerfully. Cheerfully is kind of an overused word. So let me, let me break down a definition real quick. Cheerful is to be noticeably happy and optimistic. That part we kind of know, to be noticeably happy or optimistic. But there's a second level of the definition of cheerful that is super important to us on a spiritual level. The second part of that definition is it causes happiness by its existence or by its, its appearance. Cheerful is to be noticeably happy and optimistic, but it's also to cause happiness by its existence or its appearance. Listen, God loves it when we give in such a way that it communicates joy in the giving and when it causes joy in the receiving. Hear this. When it communicates joy in the giving, but then when it also causes joy in the one who receives it. Let's look, I want, you, I want to look real quickly at how, let's look at some examples of how God gives and how this definition comes, comes to bear. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, and we look at one way that God, that God gave. What's the first thing that God gave Adam and Eve, tangibly? Hmm? The garden. The garden of Eden. The first thing God gave Adam and Eve was the garden of Eden. Let me, let, let's, let's look at what the garden of Eden was. It says, now the Lord had planted a garden in the east. In Eden, and there he put a man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life, were the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the, is the Pison. It, it winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the river Tigris. It runs through the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. If you know anything about geography, you know how important these rivers are. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Listen. The Garden of Eden was no t cheap timeshare. What we call gardens now, even, even big, nice ones, are like a patch of grass compared to what God gave to Adam and Eve. What he gave them, he gave to communicate his joy for them. He gave and said, I'm not just going to give you a little bit of land, a little bit of property. I'm going to give you a lot, and it's going to yield some amazing things for you. I want you to love this place. I want you to get what you need out of this place. I don't want to give you a place that's just going to make you have to work harder. He's like, I'm going to give you something that communicates the joy that I want you to have. But he says, I also wanted to bring joy up out of you. Amen? The second thing, let's look, let's look at the second thing God gave. It's a, God's given a lot, but I'm just going to look at too. God gave his son, Jesus. John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and what? The Word became flesh and did what? Dwelt among us, came to be with us in the form of Jesus. Now here's, here's an interesting thing about that. God could have given Jesus in such a way where he just dealt with the problem, just dealt with the issue of sin, just paid the redemption, and that had been that. But he didn't. God gave Jesus in such a way where he actually walked these grounds, lived with the people, spoke 
to the people, nurtured the people, healed the people, comforted the people, guided, talked to the people. He gave Jesus in such a way that communicated his love for us, his joy for us, but not only his joy for us, but in such a way that we could actually get joy out of Jesus' life. He could have just, he could have just done a, some transaction in heaven, Right? that dealt with the issue of sin, that dealt with the issue of man's, man's redemption. He could have just dealt with that on a high level up here, and we had never been the receptor of any of it. But he didn't. He gave Jesus in such a way that communicated joy in the giving and caused joy in the receiving. But we think we're doing it big when we begrudgingly give anything. When we give our tithes or we give our offering or when we sign up for common day of service so we can get these service hours done, we think we're giving big. But we haven't even begun to give in the way that God loves. Listen, the tithe, is, the tithe and I don't want to get messed up on that because I know we get in arguments about it, but the tithe, the tenth of your earnings, that's what God requires. You haven't even, we haven't even stepped into cheerful giving until we've given something that's not required. You haven't even stepped into what it means to be cheerful until you've given past what's required. But we want credit. We want recognition for every little thing we give, even though our heart hasn't given it in a way that's cheerful. The next time we call ourselves giving cheerfully, I would say we should ask ourselves, is what I'm giving communicating joy? And will it cause joy to come up for the person or for the thing that's receiving it. I know it's going to help pay somebody's bill. I know it's going to help do this. I know it's going to do that. I know, I know, I know. But has it actually reached a level where it's a cheerful act of giving? Does this make sense? God loves a cheerful giver. i just say this story real quick. This Christmas, me and uh, Sierra, we went and we played Santa Claus to... To two, little, to two little boys. We were probably playing Santa Claus to his single mother, to their single mother more than anything. Uh, but we went shopping for these two little boys. And uh, the mom told us their clothing sizes and the stuff that they wanted for, for Christmas. And, and she uh, had, had essentially resigned, resigned to the fact that they weren't going to get anything because she didn't have any money, she didn't have any means. She had two boys. Uh, and it just, they just weren't, she, was, she was essentially going to hide Christmas. She was going to let Christmas kind of come and go and not, you know, sort of act like it was just a regular day. So me and Sierra was like, well, that's not acceptable. Right? And so we went shopping. And we went, did we go like two days? We took two days to go shopping for clothes and for toys uh, and for gifts uh, so that these boys would experience uh, a good Christmas, right? And so, we, like I said, we bought clothes, we bought toys. Uh, and we went, we went bike shopping because these are two urban kids who pretty much spend all their time in the house. And so we were like, you know what, let's get them a bike so that they can have something to, to do outside. So we went bike shopping and we had to do that for two days because the place that had the first one didn't have it and we had to go to another place, all that. So we spent a lot of time doing, you know, try, you know joyfully uh, uh, searching for gifts for these two boys. Um, so when we finished all of our shopping, we we're like, well, you have to wrap the stuff. Right? Because even if you give people a, a, a gift, the whole experience of Christmas is the unwrapping, is the tearing off, right, of the stuff. And so we're wrapping all the stuff, but you couldn't, we couldn't wrap the bike. We couldn't wrap the bike, but we're like, well, you still, have to, have, you still have, to, have to adorn it some kind of way. So we bought this big ribbon, and we bought some balloons, and we attached those to the bike. And so we take the stuff to the boys. They receive it. The mom is happy. Everybody's happy. We go in the house. They're unpacking all the stuff and they're ecstatic playing, uh, playing for a half a second with the toy. And then we turn around and you know what's happening? They're playing with the balloon. <laughs> the $2 balloon. We spent over $200 on stuff for these kids. They are playing with the $2 balloon. I'm sitting over there with an attitude like, what are you doing? The balloon is not the gift. The balloon is not the present. This stuff. But then after a while, we had to sit back and say, you know what? If that is what's bringing them joy, if that is what's causing them joy, then that is the gift. That is the present. That is where the cheerful giving happened. 
Amen? God loves a cheerful giver. Let's go to what God hates. God hates religious hypocrisy. Amen? Again, as I said the first time, and as Jess reiterated, a lot of us care more about what God hates because we want to know how much trouble we're in. Well, let's get at it. God hates religious hypocrisy. I'm going to read a verse to you in just a second, and I just want to say this before I read it. For the person who considers going to church as one of the customs or the cornerstones of how you exercise your faith, kind of like I do, uh, this is hands down going to be one of the most heart-stopping scriptures in the entire Bible. All right, let's read it. It's in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 14 through 17. It says this. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, church, I hate with all my being. This is God speaking to the people. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. God is saying to those people, those of us who take great pride in doing religious activity, he says your religious activity, your festivals, your conventions, your mood rings, your fake prayers, I don't care. I don't even like them. A lot of people say the church is doing, the church is doing a lot of stuff and, and I don't like some of the stuff that they're doing. Well, here's the thing. God doesn't like a lot of it either. God is like, shut up. I don't like your religious festivals. I don't like your conventions. I don't like your mood rings. I don't like your graphic t-shirts. I don't like that. I hate that stuff. And he said, but he says at the end of the text, he says, the stuff that I want you to care about, you don't care about. The stuff I want you to have a heart for, you don't. But then you show up at these conventions, you show up at these festivals, and you do your little religious thing. Get it? I hate it. Religious hypocrisy. I hate it. Now, here's the thing. Religion in itself, people, listen. Religion in itself is not inherently hypocritical. Even religious practices in and of themselves are not inherently hypocritical. Here's a simple definition of religion. Religion is the belief and the worship of something that is superhuman, supernatural God. Religion becomes hypocritical when we use activities for God to cover up actual intimacy and relationship with God. Religion becomes hypocritical when we use activities for God to cover up and to make excuse for the fact that we don't actually have a relationship with God. In this modern age, you know, I don't know, in the last 20, 30 years, we had this epiphany in, in, in Christendom uh, that the Christian religion should be based on relationship with Christ. It used to be you could tell people, I'm a Christian, that's my religion, that was kind of a badge of honor and award. But then stuff happened, a bunch of us Christians did some really stupid things, and so people were like, I don't want to know parts of that. So then people started saying, that's not my religion, I have a relationship with Jesus. Amen? Now here's the thing. While it might be apropos to say that you have a relationship with God or Christ, just saying that you have a relationship with God that you don't actually have is just as hypocritical as practicing a religion that you don't actually believe. Saying you have a relationship with Christ that you don't actually have is just as bad as practicing religious stuff that you don't actually 
believe. The whole point of religious activity is to remind us or to draw us back into the relationship with Christ. If you don't actually have that relationship, then religion becomes hypocrisy. And God says, I'm over it. You can keep that. You ever look at a picture uh, or take a picture with some friends, right? Maybe at a festival when you go to like the, uh, I don't know, like the fair or a concert or whatever, and everybody's like all smiles and, and happy, and it looks like the picture of a great friendship, and it looks fantastic, right? People are waving their beads or holding up whatever, you know. <laughs> and it looks like the, it, I mean, it looks like the epitome of happiness and friendship and rela good relationship is. It looks like that's everything that it's supposed to be. But you were there, and you know that either seconds right before that picture or seconds right after that picture, you and that person that looks like a friend in your picture were at odds and were not talking to each other. Like, you walked that way, and they walked that way. Yeah? And, but, but when everybody else looks at that picture, it looks like a happy picture of friends. But you know that that picture is not true because you know what happened before it and you know what happened after it. And so what it looks like to everybody else is not true and you know it's not true. That's what religious activities that are not really based in relationship with Christ are. It's like a snapshot of this moment that you want to project that's not really true. And you know it. And God knows it. You can fool the rest of us. You can fake it for the rest of us. We can fake it for each other all the time. But you know what the backstory is to that picture. Amen? God says this, If your heart is not moved by the things that move my heart, then all of your forms and all of your fashions are a joke. That's the text we just, in, in Isaiah, what he was saying is, you guys do all of this stuff, but I can't get you to do justice. I can't get you to care about nobody. I can't get you to actually pray. I can't beg you to give cheerfully. You do all of this stuff, and it looks real good. But it's a snapshot of something that's not really real. People say, you know, they don't go to church because there's too, too, too many hypocrites there. You ever heard that? <laughs> I don't go to church because there's too many hypocrites there. People, they go in there and they praise the Lord, but they still got their issues. Listen, hypocrites are not the people who go to church and still wrestle with sin. Hypocrites are those who pretend they have no sin and no need for God's redemption. Going to church or doing religious activity, what that activity may be, and you still wrestling with some things, that's not hypocrisy. That's not religious hypocrisy. Religious hypocrisy is you pretending like you have no need for God and you have no care about what's on the heart of God, but you just do stuff that looks like it does. You just do stuff that looks like you care. God hates religious hypocrisy. Look, look at one more text. Amos chapter 5. Some of y'all didn't even know that Amos was a book, but Amos, neither did I for a long time. Chapter 5, it says this, I hate I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I don't accept them. Though you bring me choice fellowship of offerings, your good stuff, I have no regard for them. He says, go away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But, but, let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. Again, God says, what I really care about, you're not caring about. What really matters to me, you're hiding, you're hiding behind all this other stuff that you do, and your heart really doesn't care about what I care about. I come from this, let me close real quick. I come from this uh, fairly expressive tradition, church tradition, the black church, in case. I've never said that. And I've gone to a bunch of different, you know, African-American churches. And, and the thing that is, is pretty, you know, standard is, is, a, pretty, is a pretty expressive uh, expression, <laughs> right? Uh, we, you, know, you know, people tell you not to believe stereotypes or don't play into the stereotypes. But stereotypes are stereotypes. Why? Because some of it is true, right? And so the stereotype that I have lived in into 
is, is a tradition that's very loud, very vibrant, very, very demonstrative, where, where, where there's a clap and there's a shout, and the shout ain't with your mouth, the shout, the shout is with your feet. Amen? It's a really active, it's a, it's a, really, uh, uh, it's a really active tradition. And, and, and so when you see me here, uh, and I might look really expressive to you all here, but according to my tradition, I have like sophisticated and totally mellowed out. Where, is Jonathan Schuler in here? John, me and Jonathan went to Seattle. Jonathan and Brenda Kang, I took them to Seattle to, to some churches there, and they were blown away by just how demonstrative the expression is, right? So, so when you say, Michelle claps a lot, she sings a lot, trust me, you, this is nothing, right? But I have kind of, you know, I've mellowed a little bit, right? But a friend of mine uh, who's a choir director, and, you know, he's, uh, he's, you know, we're just friends. And, and he put on my Facebook, I don't know why he did this on my Facebook wall. He put on my Facebook wall one day, um, Michelle, I can't wait to see you in a full-on sanctified shout. One of those. Watch a movie. <laughs> right? Watch uh, The Apostle. What's the guy's name? Aunt, uh... Robert Duvall plays, in a, plays, plays a Pentecostal preacher in this movie called The Apostle. Watch that, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Or any black movie with a church scene. So, he's like, I can't wait to see you one day in a full-on sanctified shout. I can't wait to see you go to town. Right? And so we entered into it. I didn't mean to, but we entered into this online conversation. And I said, you know... When I first came to Christ, as a young adult by y'all's age, when I first came to Christ, I went to a church where that was the tradition and, 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 and that was regular, that people just did this full-on sanctified shout. And it was, I mean, it was a sight to behold and, a, and an incredible feeling to sit in. I said, but this is, the, this is also what was true. Throughout the week, I would see those same people who were doing that. I would see those same people live like they never heard of Jesus. I would see those same people who were going at it. I would see those same people living lives like they had never seen a Bible, never heard of God, never heard of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Compton, or Tahiti. And I was like, what? That's my thing. And I said, I don't want no parts of that. I said, I don't want to look like a Christian. I want to be a Christian. I'm not saying that the, the, that, that the sanctified shout, I'm not saying that's wrong, and if you follow me to town, you might see one, but I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm saying I don't want to look like a person who just does religious stuff, church stuff, and not actually be a person who follows after the teachings of Jesus, who, who, who tries to live according to the model of Christ. I don't want a snapshot that's fake where I know that that's just a picture that I wanted everybody to see. Because God hates religious hypocrisy. Last thing, Psalms 19. We, we've read this each week that we've started this series. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. I'm going to skip around. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commands of the Lord are radiant. He says, they are more precious than gold, all these things, much more than pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey in the honeycomb. He says, basically, God, what you want is right. What you want is good. What you say is, is true. And then he ends this verse or this text, and he says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. God, let me care about your word. Let me care about your precepts. Let me care about your law. Let the words in my mouth and the meditation of my heart, let how I give and let how I live say that I care, that I want to be acceptable, that I want to be pleasing. Amen? Let me get you all to stand on your feet for just a moment. We're almost done. Jonathan is just going to lead us in a few moments of, of worship. And my prayer for us is that we just engage this moment where we care about what God cares about. 
Amen. Initially, I wanted us to have maybe seven or ten minutes where we could talk and chat and, and you sort of reflect with your neighbor about what you think about the list so far. We don't have time for that. So I hope and I pray that you'll just do that internally as, as Jonathan leads us uh, in this simple worship. Amen. Can everyone just close your eyes with me for a sec? Um, I want to ask if we can do something that's not um, out of a religious heart or out of a place of um, doing it because this is what Christians do. But I want to I want to take a posture of worship for our hearts to be centered on on Christ. So if you could join hands with the person next to you, and this act that says we are together, we are united, we are connected, and we're coming into this place of worship connected. And Jesus, we just come to you. We thank you for this place. Thank you for this time. We want to unite our hearts with yours. We want to live into being a Christian, not just looking like one. We stand here to worship you, God. Thank you, Lord, for this time. God, that we get to seek your face and we get to worship you. We get to declare, God, that it's all about you. Everything we do, everything that we are here for, everything that we want to do, everything that, God, we desire, it's all for you. Lord, we bless this day, and we ask that you would be with us, God, and that we would be aware of your presence. We'd be aware, God, that you are with us, that you are guiding us, you are walking with us. We bless your name, God. Amen. You guys are dismissed. Thank you.